they had uh, technologies that could, quote, take T ET home. Anything you imagine, we can, we've already done at the Skunk Works. And that whole area of California is like a beehive connected underneath with tunnels. UAPs, UFOs are real, and they're beginning to realize that a bunch of them are ours. Let's start with Lockheed Skunk Works. Well, of course, the Skunk Works you know, dates back to the 50s and 60s. Kelly Johnson, uh, who's, by the way, a UFO encounter report we have, was given to us by Lieutenant Colonel Heckert, uh, who knew him, who was really? our U-2 spy plane witness who en encountered these objects uh, as a U-2 pilot. But uh, And then, of course, Ben Rich. Ben Rich uh, was the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works and acknowledged towards the end of his period there um, that they had uh, technologies that could, quote, take T ET home. He also stated there were no private conversations anywhere on the earth. True. Mm -hmm no matter what your encryption is. And also he said that anything you imagine, we can, we've can we already done at the Skunk Works. Now, there's the Skunk Works that would deal with a conventional jet, rocket, you know, ramjet type classified aircraft, right? But then there's another division that is the deep black. I wanna make a distinction between the black budget and highly classified legally overseen projects. Mm -hmm. Here I'm talking about, you know, there's a guy I'm working with now who literally oversees the black budget of the United States. He was never read in on the UFO or UAP issue. And when he tried to find out, he went out to the Lockheed Skunk Works, he was told showing a bunch of these conventional propulsion systems. He was not shown the ones that are the man-made UFOs that are the electrogravitics, the things that float, boom, 100,000 miles per hour. So I think that that's one of the problems is that there's almost two parallel systems and there's very little points of intersection between the two, what I call the constitutional government of the United States. I just call the USG, the US government, legal. And then there's the illegal secret government projects, okay, the ISG. Yeah. So there are compartmented operations at the Lockheed Skunk Works dealing very specifically with this area of technology, which has nothing to do with rockets, jets, conventional aerodynamics. And it has to deal with electrogravitics, which is the ability to create a very high voltage system that causes a electromagnetic field propulsion. So there's almost like an electromagnetic field bubble around an object. It can levitate, lift, and it can go, you know, Mach 300 and never have a sonic boom and no heat on the, on the outer section of it. These are very advanced technologies. Now, those began to be studied back long before I was born and I turned 68 this week, so you can imagine how long we've had these, these things. Uh, we actually mastered gravity control in October 1954. One of the members of my team for many years was in the vault. Uh, okay. uh, he was the top scientist at the Naval Research Labs, the very large Department of Defense lab uh, in DC there. Um, I'd been in there, and he saw the documentation for this. So, uh, and I think, what the public, and, the, and this is true of the senators and the congressmen and the White House, they are not read in to these other projects. They simply aren't. You know, I had a, a friend of Trump's tell me uh, over this past weekend uh, that, that, that he said, we, they just don't tell us much or anything, or very little. Uh, so I think that these sort of operations, as Eisenhower warned, you know, have just gotten out of constitutional legal oversight. So I call those the illegal secret government projects. But those are in the Lockheed Skunk Works. So there's facilities out in the desert. Uh, if you go out to the Mojave Desert, there's an, uh, a, a facility and an underground opening. So the really sensitive uh, facilities are all in uh, uh, underground skiffs or, or dumps, deep underground military base facilities. And that whole area of California is like a beehive connected underneath with tunnels. Okay. I know where they are. I know people who've worked in them. Now remember- those are, are those all Lockheed? No because those were actually built by Bechtel Corporation or HIT Construction. There are a few contractors who build these underground connectors. Um, and for years they used a nuclear powered tunneling device that would go through bedrock and just classify it. So you'd have a connecting tunnel between say Edwards Air Force Base and Nellis hmm. Range. And you never have to go above the surface. So I'm very familiar with these and where they're located and I've debriefed a number of guys who've been on them. So it's all part of a, let's call it a, a, a coalition of operations that are corporate, contractor, and governmental, but governmental as in off the reservation of legal oversight and, and constitutional requirements. This is why the Senate and the House are moving quickly 
to get this under control because about a year and a half ago, we were providing enough information that they now realize that this is real, that the UAPs, UFOs are real, and they're beginning to realize that a bunch of them are ours, but they're being used in deceptive indications and warnings, meaning false flag operations. So this, of course, is the, the topic that I brought up to the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, General Patrick Hughes, way back in the late 90s. I said, look, you know, you guys are being completely zoomed and uh, deceived by some of these objects you think might be extraterrestrial, but they're ours. One night, they had an object on radar. I'm going to use his language, little men that look like the color of a Sicilian, kind of brown, but 39 inches tall. They are kind of materialized around them and then dematerialized off using this technology, this very advanced transdimensional physics. In the documentary, you talk about some of the uh, UFO technology. The metal is so pure it cannot be replicated. Can you ex expound on that a little bit? Yeah, so we think, you know, if you're driving a car or flying on a Boeing 737 or whatever, we dig that s stuff up, you know, aluminum and metal. We smelt it, refine it, roll it, put it together, rivets, welding, et cetera. An extraterrestrial vehicle and all its components are not made that way. They are made by creating a sort of an ultrasonic, very high-tech wave that pulls, let's call it the substrate, the elementals that are subatomic, together on, if you can visualize this, like almost like a blueprint in energy, and it materializes it. So it's seamless. The, even the, the parts that are in it anything that's energy or electronic related is on a nanomolecular level entwined in it. But this is why it's very hard to study this stuff. I mean, it's not like taking apart a Soviet MIG or something. I, didn't, I know the men who worked on these projects, and I mean, you're dealing with really extraordinary, elegant, beautiful uh, material sciences and matter. And that's why the materials are so pure, because they're not dug up and refined. They're actually assembled from this baseline uh, energy matter interface in, in space time. And the, have a, you give it, make it real for you. There was a captain on a Navy contract vessel back in 62 or three. And before he died, he contacted me, great guy. Um, and he had been, you know, they were testing the Atlas uh, rockets that were intercontinental ballistic, but these didn't have nukes on them. They were testing the, the rocket and guidance systems back way back. And they had had a lot of uh, UFO sightings because the ETs were watching how we were developing and kind of this breakout speed with thermonuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic Cold War. And one night they had an object on radar. It was triangulated. They had it on ship radar. So was, the captain has this guy say, hey, look, well, we have this boogie. And then it got confirmed from their the command center. Uh, and... They said, oh, when they, because they were able to do that, unfortunately, they triangulated it, and it was hit with some kind of weapon. This was 63, and it dropped, boom, like a rock right into the South Atlantic Ocean. So he was vectored over to the estimated point of impact and was there to retrieve it. And I have his whole story. He never wanted to come forward because even when he had to have surgery once, they had an intelligence guy in there when he was under anesthesia to be sure he didn't talk about this. But I have his whole information. So what happened is that when he got to the site, there was about a six by six pod and they pulled it up on the ship. Uh, and it wasn't the whole craft, the whole craft had gone down, but apparently there was some sort of one molded thing. And there were four, uh, I'm gonna use his language, little men that look like the color of a Sicilian, kind of brown but 39 inches tall, uh, no hair, and also no external ears, no, no pinna, flaps, very fine features. But he, the reason he contacted me, and this is why this is so funny, you know, I've debriefed a thousand, over a thousand men like this. He said, I can't figure out how they got in and out of their uniforms. So they had a one piece uniform, now no zipper and no buttons, and no visible way they could get them out of this thing. Hmm. And he says, how do they put them on? I said, well, they don't, it, they don't need a zipper or a button because they are kind of materialized around them and then dematerialized off using this technology, this very advanced transdimensional physics. And he went, oh, my God, I would have never dreamed. I said, no, I mean, it, it's how they're doing it. So this is why people who encounter an actual ET craft or the ET, the Evens, extraterrestrial biological entities, 
and they see even their clothing, <laughs> none of it tracks because it's so far advanced. Well, you know, the, there was another, um, maybe, I can't remember if it was one or two of the whistleblowers that spoke about this. They spoke about, or maybe it was you talking about it, but um, when they got into the craft, the inside of the craft seemed almost infinite. Yep, that was that was one of my was representing a whistleblower who is not ready to be unmasked yet. He still doesn't want to be known publicly. But yes, I, because you have a dimensional space shift as well. So an object that looks thirty feet across, you go in, and it was so big you could if you thrown a football, you couldn't hit the other side of it. Uh, so, you know, again, all of this gets into an understanding of physics uh, that. Unfortunately, you know, we're not teaching our kids the real physics, mm -hmm. the science of anything. I mean, we're all locked 100 years. This is the other part of the lost century I talk about, is that it has to do with medical technologies. I mean, as a doctor, I've seen some things that, oh my God, if we had that, the lives that could be saved, spinal cord regeneration, regeneration of lost limbs. Um, You've seen that stuff? Yeah, at an underground lab on the Mexican-Texas border. Sad, you know. How were you getting access to this? The people who like what I'm trying to do that are in the system take me. And <laughs> I went to one place, a very funny story, and they had, you know, they had the Marines there, you know, there was all these checkpoints, and, and the guy said, finally we got to the last one. And this was a facility, I don't say where it was, but I mean, basically World War III for all submarines to be run out of there. and. He, the, my mili my escort, my military advisor, finally we got to this last point where you go into the inner, you know, it's this huge place deep. And the guy goes, and, and, and what is Dr. Greer uh, here for? And he says, you don't have a need to know. So he played this, the same need to know thing mm -hmm. that we went in. So I'd be on full disclosure, I've never worked for the government or a contractor. I have no clearances. I don't want a clearance. Uh, but there are people who know that what we're doing, we're fighting the good fight, and the people in the system, a lot of them are very good people. This is what a lot of people need to understand. They got trapped in a system where you get read into more and more of these compartments. Next thing you know, you're in something. And the guys, one th as I say this, I want to make a call for more whistleblowers watching to come out. There are guys out there watching your show, Delta Force, Navy SEAL, uh, people in aerospace industry, various military commands that have dealt with or seen this, and they need to come forward because now there's a safe pathway for them to do it. And if you're corporate, now there's a six month clock on you. And we, we let me be very clear, we know who you are and where your assets are. And after those six months, you're subject to criminal prosecution and you'll be lucky if that's all you're subject to. So this is something, this is getting very serious right now. That's why I'm on your show. There's a, there's a six month window. Yep. When does that expire? from the date this bill is finally signed. I mean, it's out of committee, it's gonna be voted, and then it'll be, it's an amendment to the intelligence bill. Okay, so it's not actually, we're not oh, wrapped up with that. No, it's, it is, it's done. It's pretty much, it's, it's done. But it's not in effect yet. Uh, I'll, have to ask, I'll have to ask my guy who's shepherding it through.